All right. Hello, folks. Uh, welcome to uh, game development. It looks like we have just about everyone. Uh, so that is that is good. So we're going to get started. Uh, today is really just the introduction and talking a little bit about the syllabus and sort of how stuff is organized on, on Brightspace, especially if you haven't used Brightspace before, and uh, a little bit about what sort of the, we're going to be doing uh, throughout the class. So I uh, don't expect it to take too long, you know, 45-ish minutes, you know, depending on how much time I spent on some of the other pieces. Uh, if you haven't had me before, I, I know that there, that there are a bunch of people that, uh, that, that have, but there's some that haven't. Uh, my name is Micah Schuster. Uh, my email is, is on here and on the syllabus that we will look at a bit later today. Uh, if we were on campus, I'm in Dobbs 143, so that's in the regular sort of uh, CS uh, uh, sort of area. Uh, my office hours, uh, where I'll be guaranteed to be in the office hours Zoom, uh, that, that uh, the, the link's available on, on Brightspace, is uh, Thursday, 3.30 to 4.30 and Friday noon to two. Uh, I'll be guaranteed to be in there. If, if I don't have any students, I'll be sort of working on other stuff. But uh, if you drop in, uh, I can sort of help you with any issues or, or, or whatever you need. Uh, my, my formal training is actually not uh, computer science. Uh, my PhD was in uh, nuclear physics. Uh, I did uh, sort of mostly that for pretty much uh, from master's and, and PhD. Uh, and then I got uh, into uh, high performance computing. So I did a bunch of science and nuclear codes for some of the bigger supercomputers uh, uh, that are around today. Um, that's sort of how I got into more computational computer science -y stuff was through that uh, uh, high performance computing aspect. Uh, the the, the you know, science and then particularly nuclear physics these days is mostly programming and linear algebra anyway. So uh, it was sort of a natural thing to get into more computer science-y subjects uh, from that. So uh, if, if you're interested in some of the HPC stuff, I do teach the parallel computing class. If you have not taken that yet, you will likely take it with either me or potentially someone else uh, in, in the near future. So uh, I do uh, uh, like doing the HPC uh, type stuff. So, uh, so I might see you for, for one of those future classes. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, welcome to Game Dev. We uh, the first thing to, to that I, that I want to mention is we are going to use uh, Unity for this. Uh, the main reason is because C Sharp is very close to Java. Uh, if if I was sort of comfortable sort of teaching new language plus sort of Game Dev stuff at the same time, we you know might potentially use something else like Unreal or, or Godot or something. But uh, I don't want you to have to struggle with a language, with, with sort of a new language, with a lot of different syntax and, and sort of different ways things work. So uh, we will be using Unity because C Sharp is, is, so, is so close. So we're, we're overall, we're going to use Unity to create some full games from scratch. We have three that we're going to work on during class. And then you have uh, sort of stuff you're going to do with those first homework assignments and sort of a, a final project. Uh, we're going to use some other software as well. Uh, a lot of sort of indie game uh, uh, creators use certain either free software or relatively inexpensive software to make graphics and sound and music and stuff. And so I will show you some of those. That's not the focus of the class, but I want to give you an idea of uh, if you want to go and you want to create a game for whatever, for, for mobile, for, for PC, and you want some sort of quick, easy things to do to create music, to create sounds, to maybe work on some graphics, whether they're 2D or 3D, I'll show you some of those, of those pieces of software. I am not a, an expert at like music software and, and digital audio workstations and all that, but I will show you some stuff that will sort of get you started if that's something that you want to add to your game yourself without you know, going and, and paying for stuff. Uh, and we're going to learn sort of C-sharp somewhat in kind of the Unity way. So C-sharp is just a, a regular language. It's supported by, by, by Microsoft, uh, where something like Java is supported more by like Oracle and stuff like that. So they're, they're very similar in their, in their sort of target audience. Uh, there's sort of the standard C sharp, but then there's C sharp sort of used in the Unity way. So we'll kind of look at both, but we'll more or less use the, the, the Unity way uh, when we do most of our programming. Uh, grade wise, we're going to look at the syllabus. So you'll see the percentage breakdowns. Uh, whatever uh, uh, midterm grades, uh, whenever, whenever, whenever they sort of come do uh, whatever we've completed and I've graded before that time, that's what will be part of those midterm grades. And I have a few sort of textbook things. They're not related specifically to Unity. Uh, they're, they're, not, they're not required. One of them is actually just free online. You don't have to buy the physical version. So I will show you those when we talk about the syllabus. They are useful if you want to keep doing some uh, game dev stuff. Uh, one of them sort of an AI type, type book. Uh, if you took uh, 
uh, Professor Folajimi's uh, uh, sort of game AI class uh, uh, before. Uh, she she uses one of the books uh, in, in her class, and then I have an additional one that is quite useful and that we'll be doing some things uh, uh, out of. But they're they're not they're not required. Again, one of them is free online, uh, and like legally free online. The author has it posted online, but if you want the physical copy, you have to pay for it. Okay, so I want to talk about what this course is and what this course is not. So the course is about using the game engine. Unity is huge. I don't know everything about Unity. There's new features coming in all the time. There's features that are being taken out or depreciated over time as well. So I'm going to teach you the technical aspects of creating a game in Unity. What does it mean to create a script in Unity? What is a game object in Unity? How, can, how do scripts and game objects interact? And what are these components like a transform and, and, and a raycast and you know, all of these individual aspects of Unity that help you create a game? That is one of the main things. And that is the three games that we're going to make in class. That is a way for us to learn about these things, to learn about things like Cinemachine and, and raycasting and how do you spawn things and how do you create prefabs and all these sorts of things. We're going to learn about them by creating uh, games ourselves. This is about working as a team. When we go to the Brightspace uh, uh, class uh, uh, page, I will show you what your groups are. I created random groups. Every assignment will be done in groups. There's not very many assignments in this class. There's, there's like four. So you will be working in a group for all of them. That reduces some of the grading time on me, which is certainly always nice, but it gives you the opportunity to work in a group just like you would in, in uh, the real world. Uh, and it's about sort of expanding your horizons. If you've, if you've done some game stuff before, maybe you messed around in, in Java or you made a quick game or something for a CS2 project, uh, it can be quite fun. It can also be quite frustrating as well. And, and don't get me wrong, Unity can be very frustrating. Uh, but we're going to tackle a bunch of the aspects, not just the programming, but also look at things like the art. And you will see some of my very crappy art in in some of our games. You'll see you'll you'll see some of the sound that I recorded from you know my wife honking a horn and uh, and and my and my myself making funny sounds into the microphone and then editing them to use it as a splat sound for you know, someone getting hit by a car or something. Right. So these are the things that I'm going to show you kind of how to do, but also sort of let you use them. Same thing with, with music. I'll show you some easy ways to make some, some very bad music, and, and hopefully you'll be able to make maybe some better music when, when you mess around with this stuff. So it's not just the programming. It's not just Unity. It is sort of the whole package, because at the end, we're going to have a UI. We're going to have some sounds. We're going to have some art, and you will do the programming for it. This course is not about design. So this is not like a design, a design course where we talk about what makes a good game or even how to create a good game. So yeah, the games that we're gonna make, you probably wouldn't play them for 100 hours, but it's gonna give you that technical knowledge of how to create a game that maybe someone would wanna play for 100 hours. This course is not about assets. Even though we're gonna talk about creating art, creating sound, creating music, I don't know all the tools 100%. I am not very gr I'm, I'm not that great at creating music or art, but that's not what the course is about. If you create some crappy art, some crappy sounds, some crappy music, that's perfectly fine here. The sort of grade for stuff is mostly based on whether you follow the instructions for whatever the assignment was and does it work? So, you know, your program's not crashing or something. If it's, ba if it's bad music or the music repeats too often, you know, you do like a 20 second loop or something and it's very repetitive, you're, you're not going to get, you're not going to get docked for that. The point is having some music so that you can technically, in the Unity engine, play the music. That's, that's the key, because you can always come up with better music if you have more time, or better sounds, or better art, or whatever. Uh, this is not an intro to programming. It would be cool to have a CS1 course where you started out like this, and you started like using Unity, but that's, that's certainly not what this course is. So C Sharp is similar enough to Java that you shouldn't have any problem adapting. There are some syntactic differences, and we will have a lecture where I talk about some of the, the similarities and the differences, uh, but it just takes sort of using it. So if you've never used C-sharp before, don't worry. Almost everything is the same. In fact, uh, on the Brightspace uh, page, I do have a couple of links to to like uh, like like sort of quick and dirty C-sharp for Java developer type stuff. And one of the websites says, 
it's the same, seriously. So most of it's the same. There's just a couple of syntactic things that are different. And C Sharp has some cool features that I'll show you a little bit of uh, as we go through. So overall, I do expect you to know how to program. When I talk about we're creating classes or I'm going to make this, I'm going to make this abstract or I'm going to override this function, you should know what that sort of stuff means. So uh, in principle, CS2 is really all you need to be able to do this class, but uh, the, I think algorithms is required for it so that you have a little bit more practice with, uh, with sort of programming overall. So there's not crazy algorithms or we're not going to use crazy data structures to do anything special. You know, we'll use like a list. To, to do this stuff. And the algorithms we use will mess around with some vectors here and there. So it's not going to be anything crazy, but you do have to know some of those fundamental object-oriented programming concepts. So does anyone have any questions so far, just with sort of the, the very beginning sort of intro stuff for the class? All right, so we're going to talk about the syllabus, and I'm going to go over. Uh, yeah, this is this should be Brightspace. I'm going to go over some of the Brightspace stuff. So uh, lectures and assignments we posted on Brightspace, not not Blackboard. This must have been one of the slides I missed. Uh, and we're going to use GitHub for assignment submission. So if you've used GitHub Classroom in the past for maybe CS1 or CS2 or potentially something else, uh, we will be using that. Uh, it's set up to use groups. You just have to sort of manually go into the the correct group that. Uh, that you need to be in, and then you'll have access to all to the same repository. So you won't all have a different repository for, for the assignment. You will have all the same repository, everyone in your group. So you can you know, push stuff up and pull stuff down and do all of the normal Git stuff you do when you're collaborating. Uh, on the syllabus, the sort of important stuff, you know, other than the, than the boilerplate, are the topics, so sort of the, the schedule, the weekly schedule, uh, the grading policy and expectations, you know, things like uh, uh, attendance and stuff like that. So, uh, so we're going to hop over to Brightspace again, not to Blackboard. I think everything is going to be switching to Brightspace soon-ish. Uh, they were originally supposed to switch completely to Brightspace this semester, but they sort of backed off of that. So uh, everything will be switching to Brightspace in the near future. So I have not used Brightspace for a full class before, so uh, for like a full semester. So you guys are basically my guinea pigs because I'm still running uh, CS2 as is, uh, is, is a regular uh, Blackboard class. So let's hop over there. So here is the uh, sort of Brightspace main page. Uh, obviously, if you are here in the uh, in, in in the Zoom, then you saw this, so our regular Zoom link, and then my office hours link. So if you want to come see me during office hours time, this is the one that you use. Uh, it has a like a waiting room and stuff, so I can uh, uh, sort of let you in or keep people out if I'm with someone, for example. Uh, the next thing under the sort of the main page on the announcements is a Java guide to C Sharp. So there's a few in here, uh, there's some quick and dirty ones uh, that just, you know, uh, 15 minute intro to, to C Sharp for Java people, stuff like that. Uh, these are these are very quick. They show you just some of the basic concepts and sort of what the differences are or the, what the similarities are between C Sharp and Java. Uh, if we go to one real quick uh, here, this one, the syntax, it's the same seriously. So. Uh, you can take a look at, at one of these either either now or potentially when we do the, the lecture when we're talking about C Sharp. Uh, they go over the basic stuff that, that you'll need to know. Uh, you don't have to do this. I have a bunch of this stuff on slides, but uh, it could be worth it uh, if you want to do it beforehand or, or later on. And most of these websites are basically the same. Uh, there's a more in-depth one, uh, the C Sharp uh, versus Java. It's, it's huge. So you could go there and look at every individual detail you want to. And then I also have this PDF uh, here that uh, gives very sort of concise differences between things like keywords, operators, common data types. So for example, in Java, you would type Boolean. Zoom this in a little bit. In Java, you would type Boolean. In C Sharp, it's Bool. So, so stuff like that, They're just looking at things like, oh, you know, to, to access, you know, the dot operator, it's the same thing. Uh, method invocation, same thing. So all of this stuff is in there. Some keywords it don't exist in, uh, some keywords don't exist in, in sort of one or the other. Uh, there are some in here, let's see. Yeah, the constant go-to uh, keywords in Java have no function. Uh, the C-sharp constant and go to our, our operational. So they give you some information about it. Keywords that are not found in Java or have a different behavior, all here. So this is a useful PDF in case you want uh, to see just what those sort of keyword or type differences happen to be. So uh, I do recommend taking a look at this. 
uh, especially if we go through something in class and you're like, wait, I don't understand what, what was that operator doing? It, it, it does something different in Java. It, it, it doesn't look like what we're, what we're doing in C Sharp. This is the place to go and take a look at that. So some resources there for you, but we will talk more about that uh, in the C Sharp lecture. Uh, after that is the assigned teams. So I just did a sort of a random creation of the teams. If you don't see your name in here, there was some some folks that had, that had sort of dropped in and, and came in. So if you don't see your name in here, please let me know. Uh, each, each of the teams ha has a name. This is how they'll be identified in uh, GitHub Classroom. And uh, you will just add yourself to the team when you go and get the first assignment. But these are what the teams are. Uh, I can potentially facilitate some some communication, but uh, I would recommend uh, uh, you sort of hit each other up on the on the chat here or or elsewhere uh, if you uh, want to grab each other's emails or whatever so you can communicate. Uh, one of the questions I had last semester when I taught the class was what was I using in my IDE? So I will likely be using VS Code. Sometimes it can be a little bit of, of a pain when it hooks up to Unity or it hooks up like incorrectly and then you have to like you have to restart unity or something but it, it can be a little bit of a pain but my my vs code stuff is here just some of the standard things that i that i happen to use uh for c sharp and unity so just some of the, the extensions and stuff so if you're if you're going to use vs code you can take a look at these a lot of them are pretty standard you, better comments is pretty standard bracket pair colorizer is a very common one so uh, i don't use anything anything crazy here there are a couple of unity specific ones so there's some snippets which just make you know, writing a snippet easier. And then there was a debugger for Unity, which I don't actually use that often. Uh, I've messed around with it in sort of small things, but never in, in a big uh, a big project. So I don't 100% know how, how good it is for larger projects. Uh, and then a couple of things, like the font I'm using and whatnot. So uh, if you're interested in using VS Code, that's you can take a look at this. You can use Visual Studio. That is usually installed with uh, with Unity. Uh, I've had add people use Writer last semester as well from uh, JetBrains. So uh, there's lots of IDEs out there. You, you could use Notepad, you know, whatever. But uh, I'll, I'll most likely be using uh, uh, VS Code. So those are the announcements that I have now. If anything new comes up, I'll probably put it uh, below uh, the Zoom meeting information. So I'll organize it so that the newest stuff is below the the, the Zoom links. Uh, that way, these are always on the top. Uh, so if someone has a question or something where it's it's uh, it's related to I don't know some Unity thing that maybe you know uh, maybe there's a, a better debugger or there's a guide for the Unity debugger or something that 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 somebody mentions I might post something like that up here just so everybody can can have access to it uh, and and view it and, and whatever so anything like that that comes up I will put in this announcements section as far as the course content goes there's a content browser on on the main page. Uh, there's a folder for the syllabus and a folder for the course materials. You should also, and I don't know exactly what the student layout for this looks like, but you should also be able to click on a content up here on the top bar, and that will bring you to uh, the, the content here as well. So you should be able to do that. To, you know, if you haven't messed around with Brightspace too much, it's relatively straightforward, but it's definitely different than, than what, we, uh, what we were doing when we had Blackboard. So the first thing is the syllabus. So we're going to take a look at that first, and then I'll go over the organization of the, of the course materials. So the syllabus is here. You should be able to download it uh, if you don't want to look at it uh, online. And you know, for the most part, this has this is just boilerplate stuff. Uh, there's you know the course description and all of that. I do want to mention those those uh, recommended texts. So. Uh, I think my, my camera here is, is sort of a flipped version, so this stuff will all be backwards. But uh, this is the Game Programming Patterns uh, book. I do have a physical copy of, of the book. Uh, I like being able to sort of flip through it and, and, uh, and, and read the stuff out of there. But it is also, uh, it is also online. So this, this is the book that's completely online, Game Programming Patterns. We will use some of these patterns uh, this semester. So I will show you how we can implement certain patterns from, from this book in, in Unity. Uh, so if you go to the website, it's just gameprogrammingpatterns.com. Uh, you can buy a print version. He has an ebook version. He has a PDF that you can buy or just the web. So if you do the web one, it is the full book. It's not just a, a, a slimmed down sort of preview version. It's the full book. So we will talk about, for example, we'll talk about the singleton. And he's got, he, he does sort of examples, has little notes and stuff. On some of these, he has pictures as well. So this is quite useful. Um, we'll probably use, let's see, there's another one in here. 
uh, yeah, we'll, we might use the object pool. It's one that I use quite often in my own personal stuff. Uh, we might use the object pool. So it's just, it's patterns that solve particular types of problems that you might be having in your program. So uh, some one of the ones we're gonna use, the factory pattern is actually not in here. Uh, so, so it's one that I'll, I'll sort of go over in more detail, uh, but Unity by itself, without you doing anything, uses some of these as well. It uses a component pattern and it uses the game loop pattern and it uses the update method pattern. So Unity itself does take advantage of some of these types of actual patterns. And as we talk about them, you'll sort of get a better idea of what a pattern actually means. But I highly, highly recommend that you take a look at this. I've, I've read through pretty much all of them. Some of them I didn't, I didn't really uh, uh, go through in, in, in a lot of detail, but these are uh, very useful for making games. Because in the end, you want your game to be as extensible as possible. If you want to add, for example, a new enemy or a new item, you don't want to have to change lots of code. So what some of these patterns allow you to do is write your code in such a way that it makes it easy to do those sorts of things. Add another player you know, for multiplayer stuff or add another enemy or a new item or whatever it might be that you want to do. So we will look at some of those. Uh, singleton and state are gonna be two very important ones that we're gonna be using uh, in, in several uh, uh, interesting cases. Uh, if you've heard of singleton before, I usually talk about singleton in, in, in at least CS2. Uh, there is, it, it's, almost, it's almost a religious argument. Some people hate it, some people love it. I'm sort of in the middle, so we will talk about that when we, when we get to it. But there, he, he goes over all that stuff, uh, which is quite nice. So that is one of the books that I highly, highly recommend. Uh, the other one is the Artificial Intelligence for Games. We're gonna do a little bit out of here. Obviously, this is not an AI class. Uh, that's something that uh, I said uh, Professor Fulajimi does. Uh, but this is the this is the AI, this is the artificial intelligence for games book. Uh, this is the one that I'm pretty sure uh, is used in the game uh, the, the the AI for game uh, class. We're going to use a little bit of the movement AI out of this. So that's sort of the first the first section of this book is is, is all about movement AI. So we're going to use a little bit of that because we're going to have some enemies that sort of chase us to a to a particular point and like like chase us and then stand there and shoot like range stuff at us. So we'll do that sort of thing with with uh, movement AI. But that's about as as far as we go. Uh, the required software, you do need Unity, of course. Uh, this game engine, you can download it from unity.com. Uh, with Unity, uh, you should be able to download and install Visual Studio sort of at the same time. Uh, you don't have to use this. Again, you can use Writer, you can use VS Code. Uh, those are sort of some of the main ones that connect relatively easily with uh, Unity. Uh, but uh, Visual Studio is sort of the, the default one. If you, if you don't want to use VS Code, you've never used it before, you don't, you don't want to use Rider, you don't want to use JetBrains stuff, then Visual Studio will be the one that you use. And I've had, I had students last semester use, use all three. So there are people with VS Code, uh, Visual Studio, and, uh, and Rider. As far as some of the arts and music and sound stuff go, uh, I have uh, some of the recommended free software uh, here. Some of you might have sort of paid versions of this stuff, which is perfectly fine as well. Uh, uh, GIMP is a 2D drawing program. That's that's the sort of thing I think is sort of Photoshop style. Uh, Blender is a 3D modeling and, and animation program. That's Blender is super powerful. I, I mess around with Blender uh, a bunch. I don't know everything about Blender for sure, but uh, I do mess around with Blender a lot. And there's lots of good places to go to find tutorials about Blender. Uh, Bosca Seal. I don't know if that's the pronunciation here, but Bosca Seal is a music creation program. I will show you what that looks like uh, in the future. Uh, you don't have to download anything. You could actually do it all online, or you can also download the program as well. Uh, BFXR, that is sort of the chip sound creation. Uh, think of uh, like when you collect a coin or something in like a Mario game, like that sort of sound, this can easily make those sorts of sounds. So I've done stuff like that before for uh, like explosion type stuff. You can make some explosions and then do variations on it. And I'll show you what that looks like as well. Uh, for audio recording, I typically use uh, Audacity. With Audacity, you can then sort of clip stuff out and, and modify it if you need to do like fade outs and fade ins and whatever you need to do. Uh, for the for the final project, uh, uh, I don't know if I don't know if anyone at, at Wentworth has done this before, but I did do the final project with the students. So I did, I did create a game uh, as a final project following the the, the theme that I had uh, the theme that I had assigned, and I recorded a whole bunch of stuff with Audacity. Uh, 
So I recorded myself making splat noises. I recorded my my snowblower to get engine sounds. I recorded my my wife and son honking the horn on the car to get honking sounds. So uh, you know, you just you do with Audacity. You record somewhere. You bring it somewhere else. You bring it into Audacity. You know, mess around with it and 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 get your sound clips out. So uh, I can potentially show you some of that as well. I don't know a lot about Audacity. I mainly just use it to clip stuff and potentially do some fading and uh, and sort of pitch changes and stuff. If you have some of this paid software already, it's perfectly fine to use. If you want to look into some of this software uh, to see sort of why it might be worth buying, you can certainly do that as well. There's obviously Photoshop. Uh, I haven't used Photoshop since they started doing the uh, sort of yearly subscription stuff. So I haven't used Photoshop in many years. Uh, typically for uh, any of my 2D stuff nowadays, I use Affinity Designer and Affinity Photo. That's where I process my astro photos and stuff too. So typically I use this one mainly because it was only it only cost $50 uh, uh, to buy and you had it forever. Uh, I, I've sort of fallen off the Photoshop bandwagon. Um, Something like Pixel Edit or A Sprite, if you've heard of those before, those are relatively cheap sort of pixel drawing programs. So, you know, if you've messed with those before, great. Um, and there's plenty of other 3D modeling software out there, Moto, Maya, 3 Studio Max, all of those as well. If you do want to get more into some of the 3D modeling stuff in the future, Maya is typically what uh, sort of game studios are using for the most part nowadays. Uh, that's that's changed since I was in high school. High school was all 3D Studio Max for video game stuff. Uh, but uh, uh, Autodesk has sort of bought all of them. Uh, <laughs> the Autodesk bought 3D Studio Max and Maya and, and a few others as well. So uh, Maya's sort of the typical one. So if you want to use the actual industry standard versions of these, Maya would be the one to go for. I, I don't have it listed here, but you can certainly find it. Um, attendance wise, uh, it's good to come to class for sure. I will be recording all of the, the lectures. I, 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 don't, I don't take role, so it doesn't really matter if, if you're here or not, but it gives you that opportunity to potentially ask, to potentially ask questions. Um, you know, you'd, be, you'd be able to, to, to interrupt me or ask stuff in chat or do whatever uh, for uh, as we go through in class. A lot of the Unity stuff, at least initially, is navigating menus and things. So for example, if you miss something in, in class, you can ask me questions and I can explain something in a little bit more detail or whatever. So I do really suggest that you, you come to class, but I will be recording all of the lectures. Um, there's a few few other boilerplate stuff here. Um, as far as the uh, grading uh, scale goes, the assignments are 75%, the final project is 25%. There will likely just be four total assignments. I think on the... Uh, schedule on at the end of the PDF here. I think it shows like a PA3, but we likely won't do that one. Uh, if you've had me before, uh, particularly for something like parallel programming or something, uh, I am a fan of uh, writing and you will be doing a little bit of writing. Two of the assignments are game design documents. Two of them are uh, adding or sort of finishing the games that we were working on in class. And the last one is the final project. So four sort of regular assignments and one final project for five things to go. Uh, and then, the, of course, the grading system is is, is sort, of, sort of normal for this. Um, I do want to mention the way that I sort of view this class, and it sort of goes into some of the grading stuff here. This isn't your sort of typical programming class. It's not something where you're going to be, you know, you're not learning about more OOP. You're not learning about, you're not, you're not learning how to, I don't know, how to make a web page or something. You're not learning those sort of technical things. You're learning how to use Unity to make a game. So I see it more as, if we sort of use like an English class analogy, analogy, I see it more as a sort of creative writing style class. Like I, I can't take away points on your, on your game because your game sucks. Like all my games suck. So, so it's not like you're gonna get a B because your game's not good enough, right? The only reason you get a B is if you didn't do something that the assignment required. Like if I told you to, you make a particle system so it looks like there's an actual fireball and you just don't do it, then yeah, you're going to get some points off. But if you do it and the fireball looks like garbage, it doesn't matter. You still did it. So I see this as sort of a creative writing type class. What that means in terms of your grade is that as long as you do the things that I ask you to do, you're going to get an A. Now you could kind of say that for most classes, like, oh yeah, if you if you do the work, you're you're gonna get you're gonna get a good grade in the class. But for this one, a lot of the work will will 
Some of it will be sort of aesthetic stuff, like a particle system for a fireball. It's not going to be the technical things of coding up an AI or something. You might end up doing that, and that will contribute to your game maybe being better than, than it was before. But I'm not going to take off points if your AI sucks compared to if your AI is, is better or something. That doesn't mean that you can sort of slack on all the stuff you're doing. It just means that as long as you do it, there's not really a situation where I'm going to take off a ton of points for stuff. So, uh, so hopefully that you, you can you can be rest assured that as long as as long as you do what the assignments ask, you're not going to have to worry that much about the grade. I'd rather you worry about uh, Unity itself, or maybe trying to make a cool particle effect, or make make a cool music track or something, than worry about you know if you if you spend if you spend too much time working on the music, am I going to get a bad grade and other stuff? Because as long as it's there. You're, you're going to get a good grade. I think I think I think everybody last semester got got A's if I remember correctly, just because everybody did all the stuff they they were supposed to do. Uh, add drop wise, uh, I don't remember when the drop date is. Uh, you, you can you can look that up uh, if if you know you know if, if you don't like the I don't know if my voice is annoying or something or you don't like what you're seeing or or hearing, uh, you can certainly uh, drop before the drop deadline. Uh, the rest of this is mostly uh, boilerplate stuff for. This. I do want to mention a couple things about uh, code found on, found on the web. Uh, you certainly shouldn't copy stuff from other from from other uh, students. Uh, don't just reuse code that you find as, as a solution. Uh, I don't think there's any like solutions to the to the games that I that I that I sort of put out there out there yet because this is only the second semester. But uh, you never know. And if, if you're just unsure, if you find something online and you're like, oh, this this looks kind of cool. It's 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 a raycast, but it's a way that we've never used it before. If you're sort of unsure that if I'd be okay with you using it, just let me know. I'll be like, oh yeah, maybe maybe put a comment as to to where you found it, and maybe they might want you to comment it a little bit more so that if I look at it, I sort of know what it's doing. You know, it's it's that sort of thing because there are lots of tutorials online. There's lots of little code snippets. That's like you know, if you want to do a, a 3D raycast to look at like a vision cone or something to to do to simulate a vision cone for an enemy. Like yeah, there's stuff out there. So so let me know if you find some source code and you're like, I don't know if I should put this in. Just let me know. I'll probably say it's okay as long as you understand what it's doing, as long as you can sort of explain to me how it's working. Uh, there probably won't be anything sort of Chegg wise, but definitely don't don't post anything Chegg or or grab stuff from Chegg. Uh, I have failed students in other classes, not in this class, but in other classes for for doing Chegg stuff. Uh, if you do cite code, I do have a few things here uh, related to citing the code. So typically you'll do things like original author. So you know, th that that might be the that might be the, the username of someone who posted something on, on Stack Overflow or something. Uh, maybe a note about what the code does, a URL uh, that you got the code from, and the date that you grabbed it from. Uh, if you took some code and then adapted it for your own use, throw in an adapted from or, or based on, something like that. A lot of this is just CYA, right? Uh, so that way, if, if I see something that looks a little weird, you know, then, then I'll know that, oh, yeah, they, they, they grabbed the code from here or they adapted it from some other code that they found. Because, uh, again, Unity is huge. There's no way we can cover everything in Unity in a single semester. So we're going to do some main stuff, and that's perfectly fine for, for what you need to do for the class. But if you find something else that's kind of cool and you want to try to incorporate it into one of the games that you do for the class or one of the final or the final project or something, and you find something neat, then, yeah. Do cite it in there. Ask me if you're worried about it, and uh, most likely you'll you'll be all good. Because I do want you to try to make some games that you think are fun as well, not just the technical stuff. But I do want you to make something that is hopefully somewhat fun. Uh, otherwise, the rest here is uh, boilerplate, uh, just standard stuff. There. All right. Uh, the games that we're going to make, and, and I'm thinking of changing one of these. I didn't change the syllabus because I'm not 100% sure, but uh, we are going to probably do a different second game. So uh, the first one will be Volcano Island. This will be the sort of very basic uh, uh, obstacle avoidance game. Uh, it's going to be 2D. Most of the games will be at least sort of 2D motion. Uh, the second game will have some 3D graphics, but it'll be sort of 2D stuff happening on sort of a 2D plane. Uh, Really, it's to help you to help introduce you to C Sharp and how it works with Unity. We're going to talk about the Singleton design pattern. I'm going to show you Bosca Seal uh, and and specifically BFXR for sound effects and music. Uh, we'll 
we'll use some of my crappy 2D graphics. We'll do a little bit of animation with my crappy 2D graphics, and I'll show you some Unity particle systems. We'll do a little bit with some UI stuff as well, some very simple UI things. So uh, it'll it'll be sort of a full product. We'll have a full product at the end, but it's going to sort of get you started with all right. This is the basic way that Unity works. This is this is what a, this is what a game object is. This is how we instantiate a game object. And if you've used Unity in the past, then then this will be sort of relatively straightforward. Uh, the second game that we did last semester uh, was focused on some stuff like camera movement and things. So think of like a like a Flappy Bird type game, but we actually follow the the the, the sort of the bird a little bit closer. So things like uh, uh, things like Cinema Machine and stuff like that, uh, if you've used Unity before. Uh, some side scrolling sort of elements, so not just a stationary camera. Uh, some phys basic physics stuff for sort of flapping and then things like that. Uh, that was what this was was supposed to 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 do. Uh, it's okay. We only spend a week on it, so it's a very simple game that you end up finishing for one of the assignments. But I think I might switch this one out for a different game, still using some 3D graphics, but a different style of game to go over a couple different concepts that we didn't get to until the end of the semester last time. So uh, that game will likely be the one that I did for the final project, uh, uh, which is called Don't Walk. Uh, it's basically ambulances hitting people crossing the street and you're, you're trying to stop it. So uh, sort of a reverse Frogger type thing. Uh, and so there's there's particle systems and there's physics and there's there's ray casts and stuff like that. So uh, similar style, not a lot of camera work stuff. Uh, the third game, we'll have more camera stuff and I don't have a logo for this one. I need to, I need to, to, to create one. Uh, this, is a, this is a 2D top-down shooter. So the player's going to sort of move around, think kind of like uh, Isaac. They kind of like... Uh, uh, Binding of Isaac, you're sort of in a room, and the camera sort of is sort of tries to sort of stay with you, but it's sort of constrained by the room. Uh, we'll have like a boss fight. There'll be some enemies that get spawned, so we'll have an AI that uh, one enemy like tries to just uh, uh, attack the player by just like running into them. Another one will stop a certain distance away from the player and shoot at them. Uh, there'll be a boss mechanic that has different phases. So all of this goes into things like uh, like a state machine and a factory method pattern and stuff like that. So uh, this is this one is where we really do a lot of stuff and we spend the most time on, on this game. Uh, there'll be mouse control for aiming, we use like WASD or the arrow keys for moving your character, uh, different types of enemies, that that sort of thing. So that's that's the plan for, for the three games. Again, we'll probably do Don't Walk. Uh, if you wanna see what Flappy Drone sort of looks like, I, I, I can always put that one up available as well, but we'll probably do Don't Walk uh, for the second game. Uh, but uh, yeah, I haven't decided 100%, but that's the way I'm leaning. The page before, I think it's the next page here is the schedule. So the page right before the schedule is some other useful resources. And these are just things that I found over the years, websites, some YouTube channels, some other software that I found over the years that is quite useful for, you know, looking at tutorials, looking at various resources for, for things. Uh, YouTube channels, uh, Things like Bracky's, although he's not doing the uh, the game dev videos anymore. Uh, he's got a ton of Unity information, lots of tutorials for different things uh, on sort of all aspects of Unity. So that's a great place to go. They're typically short, and he talks very quickly, uh, even even faster than sort of I, I tend to talk. So uh, so oftentimes, if you watch like a ten minute tutorial, you're like, oh, cool, a ten minute tutorial, and then it ends up taking it ends up taking an hour because you're constantly pausing and going back trying to figure out what what he said. Uh, but it's 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 a it's a great place. Uh, I usually uh, uh, take a look at games from scratch every once in a while. It's not a specific Unity channel, but uh, it's sort of all around game dev. He specifically talks a lot about uh, various tools. So he talks a lot about software, uh, you know, graphics, audio, uh, and different game types of game engines. It's a great place to go, if, especially if there's deals and stuff too. So sometimes like Epic or Unity or other like Humble Bundle has deals on game dev stuff. He will post information about those. So. Uh, so this, this is a great place to go to, to get some of that info. Uh, there's a few people on here that do sort of either Unity or just game dev sort of stuff in, de in general. So uh, uh, I think DevDuck is, is, is great. He does, he goes over uh, a game that he's currently making. He's switched engines sort of partway through. So he talks about that sort of stuff. It, it's, it's, it's just a one-man team. He just, you know, does stuff in the mornings, does stuff on the weekends, and he does uh, devlogs about, about his game. So it's not specifically telling you how he does everything and not showing you a bunch of code stuff, but I think it gives some insight into what it's like to be just a one-man indie dev and the, the, the software that he uses, and the hardware that he uses, and sort of his thought process. process. If you're uh, in interested in some of the, the 3D stuff and you want to mess around with some 3D art, uh, uh, 
Grant Abbott is like is the greatest guy on on YouTube for Blender. Like, like hands down the 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 greatest guy. He's got a bunch of Blender tutorials for like low poly stuff, which is a great place to start. It's very beginner friendly. I've gone through a bunch of his tutorials uh, that. That he's posted on on YouTube, uh, he does he does Blender art for games professionally. So he, typically it's like contract stuff. So he's done a lot of like low poly art for like mobile games and stuff. So he goes over his his process for doing that sort of thing. So um, and his voice is absolutely amazing. It's one of those ones that you could like listen to for hours. Uh, 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 Sebastian Lag here. He he does Unity tutorials, kind of tutorials. Uh, he mostly messes around with different aspects of Unity. So it's I see it more as he gets curious about something and then he's like, I wonder if I could do that. And then he goes and writes it. He goes, he goes and does it and then writes sort of a tutorial where he sort of explains it and, and shows code and all that kind of stuff. So uh, he's, he's, he's a very good one as well. If you want to see some of the cool stuff that you can do with unity uh, infallible code is also a good one. I don't necessarily agree with everything that he says about some of the different sort of types of uh, programming, but it's a really good resource for unity. And he talks a lot about larger game development and stuff. So it's not just sort of simple proof of concept things that, that he's doing. It's larger game development, larger app development that, that he talks about. So, some of the stuff that, that he says, like I said, coding wise or programming wise, I don't necessarily always agree with, but I think he's still a very good, a very good channel. Uh, and there, are, of course, there are tons and tons of other ones. These are just some ones that I threw in here. Uh, websites, Cat Like Coding is great. It's an absolutely amazing website, uh, all sorts of Unity stuff. Uh, and the guy goes super in depth. Like if you want to know how Unity actually renders stuff, he goes through the process of creating your own render engine using the Unity script or pi a scriptable pipeline. So it's super in depth. Uh, so his stuff's really cool. Uh, Red Blob Games is one that, that I've gone to quite uh, often as well. It's not Unity specific, but it covers lots of things like uh, algorithm type things. Like how would you make a procedural? Uh, uh, how would you make like a procedural landscape? And then be able to like use that for a game or something. So he does a lot of stuff for sort of game development that way as well. So there's there's some really cool websites here that uh, I would recommend uh, checking out. And then I put some other software in here. So Asset Forge is a kit bashing 3D asset editor. Uh, I I own that one. Some of the graphics that I made for for the Flappy Drone game well, I just threw together in there. So that's something that you could always look at. Uh, as far as other art stuff goes, uh, there's a program called Lighter, which lets you create normal maps for 2D sprites. Uh, if you know what that means, then you'll be like, oh, that's cool, because it's automatic creation of, of normal maps. If you don't, that's OK. We'll talk about normal maps a little bit later on. Uh, uh, a sprite is paid. It's a very it's a paid uh, 2D sort of pixel art program. It's very, very, very popular. Uh, actually came from a so lo long ago, I used the Allegro game engine and C++ to, to code some games. And a sprite came from that program. It was a, a sprite was made for the Allegro game engine to make sprites for Allegro. And then eventually it got spun off into its own thing to just as a general pixel art tool. So there's some, there's some cool history behind some of this stuff. Uh, LMMS, I've used this a little bit before. This is a digital audio workstation, so you can make music with it. Uh, Armor Paint lets you do texture painting on your models. Uh, Materialize can help you make textures for models and stuff. So uh, if, if some of the 3D stuff is a little bit daunting because it's like, oh, I got to find textures and then how do I put them on there and, and, and whatever, uh, Materialize and Armor Paint can, can really help with that. Uh, Blender also has 3D painting capabilities as well. So uh, there's a lot of programs out there that can help you create textures if, if you need them. And, and, uh, and yeah, uh, let's see. Yeah, Ace, Ace Bright. 20 bucks uh, in in the in the uh, chat here 20 bucks it is it is quite quite a good value i've used i've used both i've used pixel edit and and, and a sprite they they sort of target the same audience they have some different features though so you have to take take a look at take a look at a bunch of pixel art tools and see which ones uh, see which one might uh, uh, might work for you if you want to do that otherwise you can do the stuff in gimp uh, as well if you don't want to pay anything all right so our weekly sort of breakdown looks like this. Week one, tools overview. So we're going to do that next time. Uh, we'll do a quick in intro to C Sharp. I don't remember if I have one or two lectures on that. If, if I have two, that might be a little much. But but uh, I think I have sort of a basic intro to Unity in there uh, as well. So that's that's sort of the, the first two weeks. Third week, we'll get on to Volcano Island. And we're going to have an assignment uh, for the GDD. So I'm going to explain how this works uh, when I show you the game development document that I wrote for the game design document that I wrote for Volcano Island. 
So we'll start with the idea, some basic coding. Then we're going to talk about the Unity particle system. We're going to talk about the basic particle system and then the visual effects graph. So the, the sort of the GPU particles versus CPU particles. And then we'll sort of finish up Volcano Island. We're going to go over a couple of game programming patterns. And we're going to use them in the, the second game we, we create. Again, this might be Don't Walk rather than Flappy Drone, but there's only a week on those. Uh, PA1 will be due at that point. PA1 will be doing stuff with Volcano Island. So we will write Volcano Island. I will show you a bunch of stuff. And then when we're finished with it, I'm going to say, all right, add a particle system for the fireballs. Uh, code up uh, like smart fireballs that like follow the player around. Uh, make a dash mechanic so that you can press space bar when the character is moving and the character will like dash forward a little bit. Those are the sorts of things that I'll have you do for the assignment. So it'll essentially be adding to or changing some of the game that we wrote. So you won't be writing a brand new game just yet. That'll be for the final project. Uh, week eight, Unity Shader Graph. We're going to spend a week on that, talk about how to do some shader stuff. I'm not a shader mag uh, a magician. Uh, oftentimes, if you talk to a shader person, you will think that they are a magician uh, with what they can do. Uh, I don't know the, the shader languages, so I wouldn't be able to help you with like, uh, what was it, HLSL or uh, GLSL. I wouldn't be able to help you with, with those, uh, at least very much. Uh, but Shader Graph can make this stuff relatively easy. So it's sort of a node-based editor uh, if, you've, if you've never used something like that before. So we will go over that, and we'll make some cool shaders in sort of very simple ways. Uh, I also want to talk about post-processing and then how we import 2D and 3D art. For the most part, the sort of starter project that, that I'll give you for starting like Volcano Island will already have some of the assets imported. So you won't have to worry about you know, importing some sprites and then having to make sure that they're, the sprites are set up correctly and all that. You won't have to worry about that. We will talk about it later on in the semester. So we'll do some post-processing and some of the import stuff for 2D and 3D art. Uh, PA2 will typically be the addition or messing around with the second game. So either Flappy Drone or Don't Walk. Uh, Spectre is then the next place we go. So we'll just do some initial programming on that. We'll talk about some AI behavior. So we'll talk about the sort of movement AI and stuff, and then we'll integrate that into our Spectre game. Uh, and then we'll do some finishing touches. So we are going to spend sort of, for the most part, three full weeks on that, on that last game. Uh, depending on what time we have left over, we'll talk about things like the tile map editor. Uh, I'll see about throwing something in about the AI navigation mess, just sort of extra sort of topics that potentially can help you out. The date of this might change. This is the final project. The final project is a game jam style. If you've never done a game jam before, they are awesome. They can be frustrating. They usually mean long hours, but they, they force you to finish the game. And that's what, what I want you to do. So typically our game jam will be you know, four or five days where I give you a theme and you make a game you know, based on the theme or very loosely based on the theme. Uh, one of the game jams that I do like to do is uh, Let Them Dare. Uh, if you've ever done that one before, then, then you know exactly how this is going to run. If you haven't, uh, there will be one, I think, in April. I think they do April and October uh, now. And last semester in October, I went and did the game jam. I don't know if anyone else did. No one else posted anything about doing the game jam. But I did make a game, and, 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 and uh, Let Them Dare is... The, the sort of solo version is 48 hours. You have 48 hours to make a game based on a theme. So that's kind of what I'm shooting for for this game jam sort of weekend, you know, weekend, uh, sort of four or five day uh, long period. So that's what the final project is going to be. So you're going to take what, what you've learned, you know, whether you want a little bit of AI, camera movements, tile map editor, you know, whatever it might be, and you're going to make something. So uh, potentially, you know, before we get to that, I can show you what some of the other folks have made. I can, I'll certainly show you my game, especially if we do it here. My Don't Walk game uh, is what I made for the Game Jam. I didn't spend four or five days on it. I think I only spent maybe about 12 hours on it or so, uh, just over the course of a couple of days, because uh, I didn't have tons of time uh, when we had the Game Jam. But uh, uh, that's sort of what, what you can aim for, a relatively simple game that you code up with, uh, with, with your group. Uh, over essentially a sort of a weekend plus a little bit. So that's that's the idea. You will have presentations as well on your game so you can sort of show it off to everyone else that you do for the final project. So that's what the course looks like. If you've used Unity before, if you're like if you're if you're pretty good with Unity, there will hopefully be some stuff that that you take out of class and go, oh, this is really cool, specifically the game programming pattern stuff. Uh, but 
it's not going to be it's not going to be all brand new if you've been using Unity for a while. If you've never used Unity before, then you're you're definitely going to learn a lot from from the class. But even if you have, uh, hopefully, some of the stuff that we talk about in here, you know, particularly some of the AI stuff, some of the game programming patterns, maybe some of the particle system stuff that you may not have used before, or like the tile map editor stuff. Hopefully, you can still get a bunch of stuff out of this, uh, out of the class. Okay, so I know that was a lot. Questions? Are there any questions on the syllabus? All right, so I have a few other things from the uh, from the, the table of contents here. So under course materials, there's the lectures. So uh, I, I'm going to organize it by week. We'll see how this looks in here. I don't know what, like, as I start adding more and more of these, I don't know exactly how this is going to look. But content area for week one has this particular PDF document. So this is the slides that uh, that I that I was giving when we first started, and we have sort of a few more to go after that. Uh, so you'll always be able to grab those. Typically, I'll put those up, you know, an hour ish before class starts. Uh, there aren't currently any assignments, but this is where they will go. Uh, it, this includes the the PAs and the sort of GDD things that, that I mentioned. So those will be the assignments that you actually have. I also put in a bunch of game design documents here. These aren't related to like assignments or anything. They're just for you to take a look at. The first one, this is the game design document for the first game that we're going to be making, the Volcano Island game. So if we hop in here, we see, okay, here we go, game design documents, uh, all that. And we can sort of scroll down and see some of the different sections and things. So the description, we have a little table of contents, and I throw some notes in here as well. So for this game, there's a few sections we don't need. There is no story. There's not really characters. There's no marketing or funding or any, any of that stuff. And so you can sort of see where it is. And, and there's not a lot of stuff in, in all of these individual places because this game's not very complex. But this is the kind of thing that you'll be writing for the GDD uh, uh, assignments that you end up doing. So I talk a little bit about gameplay and sort of the skills that you have to use and some of the game mechanics, uh, some of the progression, losing. This is a thing where you describe what the game is going to be. The reason why you do this, especially because you're in a group, you want to make sure everybody's on the same page. Everybody knows exactly what they're going to be doing and how the game is supposed to work. You'll be doing two of these before the final project. Essentially, I will give you a topic, uh, a theme, and you'll write what uh, you write a game. You're not going to create the game. You'll write a game design document. And ideally, it's something that you could do during the final project if that was the theme, for example. So we're going to do a little bit of practice with sort of creating the idea for a game, and then when we actually get to the final project. You'll be essentially ready to go to write one of these real quick and start working on the game. That's that's sort of the point to to doing these. So here you want to be you want to be explicit. You want to say this is exactly what's going to happen. And there's a few other things here. I got a little bit of art style, some crappy graphics, some layout of what the UI is going to sort of look like overall. So if you were to go through and read this whole thing, like a little bit of music and sound, a little bit of stuff of the technical description of how I'm going to create this stuff, uh, some other things here. Uh, if you were to read this, if you were to go through and read it, you should have a very good idea of what this game is going to be. That's the point of the document. So it's not a ton of writing. It's just being descriptive about this stuff. And the other here in this section, dash mechanics, smart fireballs, extra health, this is what you're going to be doing for the assignment on Volcano Island. This is some of the stuff that you'll be adding to the game when, when we get to that point. Uh, so so this, this is a good place to start. I'm particularly reading about my notes and stuff. And I have some links in here for, you know, you know, how, what, what these things typically uh, look like and stuff. But that's why I also included a few others as well. So we, we got the Doom Bible, you know, if you've never seen this before, it's, it's, it's quite long, uh, but it does that same sort of stuff. It has things about the characters, about the episodes. It has stuff about, uh, uh, you know, the, they have a whole glossary of all their terms and they have stuff for, I, I think the calendar deals with uh, sort of the timeline of doing this stuff. So it's similar to, to other stuff just was. There's some handwriting stuff here about sort of changing stuff. Uh, it's similar, similar to this. You don't have to write, a, you know, a 20 or 30 page document for the simple games we're writing, but this is something that exists for pretty much every game you've ever played. Uh, so some people have uh, released them. For example, uh, Majestic uh, uh, Revolutions. You 
have probably never heard of Majestic Revolutions uh, or Shooter Majestic uh, Majestic no, I see, Majestic Revelations. You probably never heard of this game before. Uh, that's because this was not the final name. This is the GDD for the original uh, Deus Ex. So back in the back in the nineties. So if you if you played either one of the more recent Deus Exes or if you played the, uh, the original Deus Ex uh, from the nineties, this is the game design document for that. And so you can start to see some of this some of this sort of information. You know, it's a near future science fiction role playing game that asks if it's better to live free in a world of cha- uh, in a world of chaos or live safely in a world of someone else's design. That's the premise of of of, of the original Deus Ex and. That's exactly what this is. And they, they changed the name partway through development. And this has all sorts of handwritten notes and everything all over it. But uh, it has a whole bunch of the information about the story and what the players are going to be doing and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so there's there's a couple in here. There's Race and Chase. You probably never heard of that either. That's what eventually got changed to Grand Theft Auto. I'm not talking the 3D Grand Theft Auto. So I'm talking the original uh, 2D top-down ones. Uh, so that was Ra- Race and Chase was the original name for that. Uh, I think the Diablo pitch is, is, is quite awesome. Um, this is the original Diablo, the one that uh, uh, was published by uh, Blizzard. Uh, there's some really cool stuff in here. This is just the pitch, so this doesn't have a, all of the design information, like story stuff and things in there, like like not not a lot of it. But uh, there's some really cool things here. Uh, and I do have a video in one of the resources sections that actually uh, is the guy that wrote this pitch uh, talking about it. And it's some very basic stuff changed. So for example, the original pitch, all the action takes place in an isometric three-quarter perspective. That's, that's, that's what Diablo is. Uh, diamond, diamond-shaped uh, sort of square floor uh, diagram at or square floor spaces. The entire game operates on a turn-based system. That was the original Diablo. The original Diablo, original, original, was going to be turn-based. But that completely changed. It ended up being real time in the end. So seeing some of these pitch documents, some of these design documents of these games that ended up becoming very famous and very influential is really cool because you get to see what the thought process was originally. You get to see what the original concept was and then potentially how it changed over the course of development. So writing one of these yourself, it's a little bit of work, but it should be fun to do as well because you're thinking about a game that you want to make or a game that you think you could make in sort of a game jam style uh, atmosphere. So, so I, so I, so I threw some of those in there. I think those are really cool. And you, you, you can find a bunch of these uh, as well uh, online for other games too. Uh, I have a bunch of other resources in here as well. Uh, a lot of these are video, these are either videos or PDFs. So as an example of the video here, Diablo, a classic game postmortem. This is David Brevik. This is the guy that wrote that pitch. And this, this is a, from, from a GDC a few years back. And he talks about it. And the reason why we have that PDF from the pitch is because of this uh, GDC session. Someone actually asked him, do you still have that pitch? And he, he posted it online after the session. So that's why we have that PDF. So uh, he, he does a great job talking about it. He, he gives the story of Diablo turning from turn-based to real time and how that was like, how he was completely against that decision and how, but it ended up being the best decision that he ever made related to that game. So uh, this is a really cool one to watch. It's, you know, 45 minutes to an hour long. I forget uh, exactly how long, but uh, this is a really cool one to watch. And there's lots of these sort of GDC things out there uh, for you to see just talking about games, talking about the, the process behind creating games and stuff like that. Um, I, I threw this one in here too, uh, making of Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, Horizon Zero Dawn is not a Unity game. Uh, I want to make that clear to, to start off with. But it was more to illustrate the Noclip documentaries. So Noclip goes and they, they make documentaries about either game studios or particular games. And this one is really cool and that it goes through the process of the studio making Horizon Zero Dawn. From some of the very initial concept stuff to like literally just dinosaurs made out of cubes and then other like cubes and rectangles representing pieces that fall off when you, when you shoot it and just very basic stuff that the game originally was, was going to be co-op multiplayer and how they scr- ended up scrapping that and stuff. So it goes through this process that they went through of designing a huge game and then ending up creating it. And they talk about some of the technical aspects and some of the story aspects and how there were there were like rifts in the development community that they were creating it between certain features they should get rid of. There was originally like horses you, you could ride around on, like you would have your own horse. They eventually got rid of that. So and there were a lot of people against it. So so there's some really cool stuff in watching some of these no clip documentaries. So uh, 
if you do watch this one and you like it, there are lots of other ones that talk about various games as well. So I thought this was really cool to, to, to illustrate some of the larger sort of game development that happens. And that typically when you start creating a game, it looks like crap. It's really garbage. But the point was they were trying to get the, the concepts down. They were trying to get the mechanics down to see if those were fun. And then at that point, then you start adding the fidelity to it. Uh, there's a few PDFs here. Uh, if you played Hard Space uh, Shipbreaker, there's a there's a, a case study here about the graphics that that, that was done in Unity. Uh, there's some game optimization best practices that Unity released. And there's a couple more videos. We're actually going to take a closer look at this VFX of Diablo. This is particularly the VFX of Diablo 3. They do some shader stuff in here. And the really cool thing is that we can mimic some of those shader things in Shader Graph in Unity. So I will show you uh, uh, a mimic, uh, sort of a mimic thing with uh, Shader Graph Unity for some of the stuff that, that, that they did in here. So this is a cool one to watch because once you sort of learn Shader Graph in Unity, then you'll be like, hey, I think I can do that. I think I can make something very much like what they did in Diablo 3. So I think this is a really cool one as well. And then finally, uh, if, you played, uh, if you played like Prison Architect, or, or DEF CON or Darwinia, these are some older ones. Uh, DEF CON, I think when I was an undergrad, I was playing DEF CON with a buddy of mine because it had came out recently. And then I played, I've, I played all these, but if you played like Uplink up or Darwinia before, uh, these are the same guys that made those. This is the uh, introversion uh, software developers and they call this their fail masterclass. And I think they were planning on doing once a month. So I think there's, there's a couple of these out right now. And this is the first episode and it's, I think it's about an hour long or, or some of that 45 minutes long. And they go over stuff that they scrapped. They show the, the sort of the, 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 whatever they had worked on that was working and sort of what the game was supposed to be. And they talk about it. And ultimately they tell you why they decided to scrap the idea and not, not, not pursue it any further. And to me, that's super powerful because it shows you that these guys were super successful with 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 several other games like Prison Architect. Uh, they went, they would go through, they would go through months or even years of making something and then ultimately scrap it and then show you what the game was, tell you what it was supposed to be, what their what their sort of point was in making it, and then tell you why they 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 stopped working on it and, and scrapped it. So. Uh, to, I think this is really cool because it shows you that, yeah, there's there, the stuff that we see that gets published on Steam or whatever, or, or, or Epic or whatever, it's just a small percentage of, of what folks work on. So these guys, they do the exact same thing. They work on something for a while and it just isn't working out and they trash it. And so, so, they're, so they're, they, they've called this their fail masterclass, the games that, that, that they failed on. So I think this is really cool to watch too uh, uh, as well. So there's just some other resources. If I find other stuff or something, I, I might throw it in there and then and then mention it. Uh, so, so yeah. So this this is this is that sort of uh, uh, sort of other resources area where there might be something cool that that that, that you might see. So I recommend watching them. It, there's not going to be a there's not going to be like homework on them or something. I just think that they're really cool to watch to see sort of what you might be getting into if you decide to pursue game dev uh, even more after after this class or after you graduate. Uh, and final project wise, right now there's just a presentation rubric in there. Uh, I'll put the other information in there when we get to that point. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe midway ish through the semester. But that's that's the way it's organized. Uh, so it should be relatively straightforward to find stuff. But if there's ever a situation where you 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 know that I put something up or I said the the lecture is available or something and you can't find it, uh, uh, definitely let me know because it's very possible that I, I might mess something up in, in Brightspace uh, or that I might have put it in the wrong, you know, put it in the wrong place or made it so it didn't appear at the right time or something. So, uh, so definitely let me know if you have issues finding stuff in Brightspace. Okay, so that was that was a little longer than I was expecting for the for the sort of initial initial stuff here. We have a few more slides to to talk about uh, uh, before we finish. So, does anyone have any questions before I go back to the slides? All right. So, all the assignments they are group assignments. So uh, you will be working with your group for everything. That includes the GDD, and that includes the the sort of regular sort of assignments that you have to do some Unity coding stuff and, and the final project. Again, your groups are already created. They're the same group. You will work with the same group the entire semester. Uh, the the PAs, like I mentioned, they'll be based on the games that we uh, that we develop in class. 
uh, they're going to involve adding features, maybe adding some polish, maybe creating a little bit of UI that, that we didn't get around to, for example. That's the sort of thing that, that you'll be doing. Uh, and the first PA will be after we complete that first Volcano Island game. So there won't be an assignment PA-wise for a while. The game design documents, I'll talk about that in a second, the game design documents will be, there will be one uh, uh, earlier on. All right, so the deliverables for this are the game itself. So that'll be the sort of GitHub Classroom thing. Uh, the, there'll be a short document. I just want a short thing sort of explaining what, what you did. So basically, you know, think of it as kind of like a bullet pointed thing. Like if I said, you know, make smart fireballs, have a quick note about, all right, hey, this, this, is, this is how we did it sort of thing. So it's not going to be sort of a long document explaining everything. It's just, I just want to know uh, sort of what you did and, and how you did it. And we'll talk more about that once we assign PA1. The game design document, this is where each group will create one given a theme. So I'm going to, I'll give you the, the PDF that gives the requirements for it, and I'll give you a theme. And by theme, I mean something like, uh, I don't know, like, like an unconventional weapon. So you're going to, uh, it, it'll be a very broad theme. I'm not going to say, make a sci-fi RTS. It's like that, that, that's not going to be the theme. The theme is going to be something very broad, you know, an unconventional weapon or uh, uh, combine two incompatible genres, something like that. Something where you have a lot of leeway to interpret it in exactly the way you want to. Uh, so I, I have that first GDD for Volcano Island. That's something you can use as, as an example. So you can take that sort of formatting of that and you can sort of fill in what you want for your game. And then as part of the final project, your group will be required to create one of these as well during the exam period. So as soon as the sort of final project period starts, I will give you a theme, which will be, you know, whatever. And then it might be, I don't know, it might be like seasons. Maybe the theme will be seasons. And then you write a, a quick GDD, you get together with your group, write up a quick GDD of what you want to do and then start working on it. So that's, that's sort of the idea of these. So you'll have two opportunities to sort of practice and then one during the actual exam period itself. Uh, the submission is done online with GitHub Classroom. So when, before we start our first game, I will give you access to those to that repository. So you'll have the starter repository for like, like Volcano Island or something. And then you'll be able to code on that yourself, maybe using different branches or something. And then when the assignment becomes like fully available and you know what you have to do for the homework, then you can modify that, uh, that, that uh, repo so that you can have the assignment uh, completed in there. So the games we develop, I will put them on, on GitHub as well. So they'll, they'll be available for you to, to take a look at for the versions that we wrote in class, but also the starter version. Uh, all of the, the sort of assignments are going to assume that you sort of already have the stuff we did in class done. So I'm not going to tell you to make a character and animate that character. So I'm not going to tell you to do that stuff because we will have already done it in class. Uh, and then I'll grade it on the current state of your of your game and the actual documents themselves. So the GDD and here I've had Blackboard again. Uh, I'll, I'll make sure to, to change that in the, in the uploaded version. All the GDDs and the PAs, uh, the documents to those, so the PDFs that you have to write, the GDD itself and the little sort of one page thing on the PA, uh, you'll upload that uh, in this case back to uh, Brightspace. That may, that'll make it easy for me to, to, to view them. All right, uh, as far as grading goes, uh, as long as you got working game mechanics and you sort of followed the requirement, the requirements that of the of, of the PA or, or the GDD, which usually is something like adding or changing the, the game that we were working on, then then you're gonna do just fine. You're gonna get it, you're gonna get an A. Uh, we're, we're not we're not making fall guys here. So uh, I'm I'm not expecting you to have you know a multiplayer game that's sort of physics based where you're bumping everybody around and all stuff. We're we're not making fall guys or I, I put this image in last last semester because Fall Guys was quite popular, although it's sort of it's, it's declined a little bit since then. Uh, so let's see a game that's coming out uh, soon, uh, probably some like uh, Hitman Three or something. I think that comes out tomorrow. So yeah, we're we're not making something like that. Uh, you might be able to make something like Thomas was alone if if you played that game before. Uh, those mechanics in there are relatively simple, and you could probably do them uh, at the end of this class. Uh, what I'm not grading you on are the quality of your assets. Uh, if your music sucks, your graphics sucks, your 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 sound sucks, whatever that that doesn't matter. That doesn't impact your grade. And if your game is you know 15 seconds long and then and then it's game over, awesome. Uh, you're not you're not gonna. I'm not gonna expect a 40 hour game from from you guys. So assets don't matter. They're not gonna impact your grade. Uh, length of the game is not gonna impact your grade. It's gotta have working mechanics and it's gotta follow the assignment requirements. That's 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 how I'm gonna grade you. Uh, I have some boilerplate in here as well, academic honesty policy. I talked a little bit about this you know, with the syllabus, but plagiarism is sort of the, 
the biggest ones. So the big thing here, uh, the big thing here, the most important one here is, is look, look for help online, not for answers. Think about a specific thing that, that you want to do. If you need a character to, you know, move to a particular location and stop or something, right? Don't try to find a particular answer that does exactly that. Maybe see if you can find uh, somebody talking about a little bit of movement AI. And then sort of take that and maybe modify it. You can always ask me as well, uh, but modify it and then try to impl implement it into your game. Uh, there's lots of tutorials out there. You can certainly ask me if you have any questions about whether or not you can use some code from somewhere. Uh, don't use somebody's work, someone else's work. Don't search the internet for prepackaged answer. Don't say you're working on a team. That's particularly important for this class, uh, but then let someone else do all the work. Uh, if I find evidence of the, of the do nots, the sort of policy is to fail the class and get reported to the academic disciplinary board. Um, I have failed students before, not in this class, but I have failed students before for doing this sort of thing. So, so, so don't, don't do it. Uh, the main thing for this class is we're going to try to have some fun because creating games is fun. So I don't, I usually don't think this is too big a deal in in sort of a, a, a more of a creative writing style class, but uh, uh, if you do find something that sort of helps you out, just let me know or make make sure that you uh, that you that you cite some, some code or some in some something that you found so so that I know. All right, wrap up. Uh, if you put in a lot of effort, you will get a lot out of this class. Making games is fun, and even though. As long as you do the work, you'll essentially get an A in the class. That doesn't mean it's easy. Unity can be super frustrating. Unity, there, were, there will be times it's like, why isn't Unity working? What is this error? What in the world is going on? So it doesn't mean that it's easy. It just means that it might be more fun than a class like you know, CS2 or algorithms or something like that. Uh, we're going to create several games in class, but of course, playing around with the programs, playing around with Unity playing around with any of the other auxiliary programs you use, like Blender or something, is going to make you better at all of this, especially if you if you want to try doing sort of a one-man indie dev thing on the side. You might have to do just about everything. And so getting a little bit of experience with Blender, with Bosca Seal, with the, with the digital audio workstation, with some sound stuff, it'll, 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 it'll get you right on your way to, to making a game that, uh, you might want to, that you might want to publish in the future. Uh, learning new tools like this is probably one of the hardest aspects of programming. But because you're learning this, this sort of toolbox, because you're learning Unity, because you might be learning some of the other programs, uh, will, it will benefit you in, in, in the future, for sure. Even if you never program another game, adding these sorts of experiences and, and tools to your, to your repertoire, I think, is, is, is very important. So we're going to learn the fundamentals of Unity and sort of some of the fundamentals of game dev in the class after this semester. Uh, I do highly encourage you to try other game engines. If you've if you if you've you know you've heard of Unreal Four or you've heard of, of Godot or, or other engines, awesome. Take take a look, see what they have to offer. They they might be, you know, Unreal might be more intuitive to you. Uh, you might like the way that 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 Godot handles certain things. That's perfectly awesome. There's there's sort of the only way the only place to go after this if you want to keep doing game dev stuff is up because as soon as you learn the basic stuff, you can go any direction you want to, 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 learn, new, uh, to learn new tools and new engines and all that kind of stuff. So I highly encourage you to mess around with, uh, with some of this extra uh, stuff after we're done with class or stick with Unity. That's perfectly reasonable as well. All right, so next time, uh, we're gonna do a tools overview. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Unity. I'm going to talk a little bit about Visual Studio. I'm going to talk a little bit about Git. Uh, I want you to download and install Unity before next class and get whatever IDE you plan to use up and running, whether that's VS Code, Writer, Visual Studio, whatever it might be. I'll be using one of the most recent LTS versions. I don't know if the 8 here is still the most recent one. I don't think it is. Uh, but I'll be using 2019.4. something uh, uh, LTS for the whole class. Uh, I know it's already 2021, uh, but I want to use one of the long-term service ones. Uh, it's a good idea, whatever version you pick, that you consult with your group because you want to try to make sure that your group has the the, the same version uh, of Unity whenever you're working on the projects. And my recommendation is just to freeze it. Don't worry about updating Unity for the semester. That way you don't have to worry about any incompatibilities that happen or any conversions. If someone has an older version, you have to convert it to uh, the, the new version for you to use it, but then you push that up and now it's a higher version than someone else has. So pick a version, it doesn't really matter which one it is and make sure that everybody has the same one. Uh, I'll be using VS Code, uh, and so I'll show you a little bit about that. But if you use something else uh, like Rider or Visual Studio, it should work as well. Uh, 
that is that that is all that i have so it did take a little bit longer than than i wanted to but uh uh that's that's all i got for uh, uh today so we're gonna jump right into some unity stuff and some c sharp stuff over the next uh, week or so so yeah that's uh that's it so uh if you guys have any questions uh let me know and i will see you guys on thursday so have a good rest of your day thank you thank you, thank you professor see you guys Nice. Have a nice day, Professor.